family Westwood Village Rotary Club. Our four-way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Gerard, will you lead us in pledge, please? I think- Can Gerard, you hear me? Can you hear me? Now we can. Okay, good. All right, everybody stand. Place your hand over your heart. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag of the United States of America and, and to, to the, the republic, republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ron, will you lead us in the thought of the day? I will. In honor of our speaker today, I have a few thoughts about outer space from those who should know. I'm coming back in and it's the saddest moment of my life. That's Ed White he expresses his sorrow at the conclusion of the first American spacewalk during the Gemini 4 mission on June 3rd, 1965. I didn't feel like a giant. I felt very, very small. Neil Armstrong, I'm looking back at the earth from the moon on July, 1969. When I first looked back at the earth standing on the moon, I cried. Alan Shepard talking about his time on the lunar surface during the Apollo 14 mission in February, 1971. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. Carl Sagan describing the pale blue dot image of earth taken by the Voyager 1 spacecraft six billion kilometers away in 1990. Hmm. From out there on the moon, international politics look pretty petty. You want to grab a politician by the scruff of the neck and drag him a quarter of a million miles out and say, look at that, you son of a bitch. That was Edgar Mitchell, Apollo 14 astronaut speaking in People's Magazine in April 1974. Anyone who sits on top of the largest hydrogen oxygen fueled system in the world, knowing that they're going to light the bottom and doesn't get a little worried, does not fully understand the situation. <laughs> John Young, after being asked if he was nervous about making the first space shuttle flight in 1981. And uh, last, the words on a plaque left on the moon by Buzz Aldrin and Neil Armstrong. Here, men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon. July, 1969 AD, we came in peace for all mankind. Thank you, Ron. Very thoughtful as it was then, as it is today. <clears throat> okay, Taya. Ed Gold, will you lead us into song, please? Uh, yes, I will. Uh, uh, two comments. Uh, the first comment is uh, I just came back from the barber shop, which is almost across from Trader Joe's in Westwood Village. And when I got out, two doors down, Joe Biden was having lunch. And I, it took me forever to get out because the traffic was chaotic. I guess he's trying to go for the Hispanic uh, vote because he's eating at a uh, uh, Mexican restaurant and having tacos. Hmm. Uh, number two, uh, Monday was Columbus Day. And I think uh, instead of uh, Columbus Day, they call it, and I may be wrong and somebody can correct me, uh, Arbitrage Day. And uh, I, I picked the song. people. <laughs> That's right, indigenous people. So I picked the song that has something to do uh, with the discovery of America and its 
this land is your land. <clears throat> so here I go. <clears throat> Excuse me. This land is your land. This land is my land. From California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Gulf Stream waters, this land was made for you and me. As I was walking that ribbon of a highway, I saw above me that endless skyway. I saw below me that golden valley. This land was made for you and me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any guest of Rotarians? Hi. Phil. I have by Vadim. He's a good friend of mine from, from Pine Mountain Club. And he's a he's a he's an avid uh, astronomer. He likes to study the stars in the sky. So he's here today. Welcome. Thank you. Any other guests or visiting Rotarians? Okay. Some announcements. Let's start with Diane. Diane, you're muted. Okay, just a reminder. <clears throat> Next Thursday, uh, the district governor will be visiting the club. We encourage everyone to bring their, their spouse uh, and or guest. Uh, we'd like to have a big turnout if at all, all possible. And that will be at Guido's. Also, uh, Rotary for the November event is now looking for silent and live auction donations. If anybody's interested in putting a basket together, just let me know what they'd like to contribute uh, and I'll collect the items to put together. <clears throat> uh, finally, October 27th, Rotary Means Business is the first district mixer the district governor is hosting from six to eight. I believe it's in Van Nuys, California, and everybody is uh, welcome to participate for, I think it's $10 or $20, which includes one drink ticket. Okay, thank you. Ben, you wanna talk about October 22nd? Yes, October 22nd, we're having an exciting event at the Reagan Library. Um, I will send everyone a reminder uh, with the directions. We're going to meet at 1230 prompt in front of the Reagan Library. Uh, it could be now we did miss the window to see World War II, but they do have other things that are great there. So we'll enjoy ourselves. Um, and the announcement for November quickly, uh, I'm suggesting that everybody support the Rotary Foundation uh, event uh, in November. Uh, I, Susan and I bought the $75 tickets just to sit with everybody. And I suggest that we support it as a, as a group. Uh, last year, I had a blast. I was at the Skirball and I wouldn't miss it. So and it supports a really good cause. Right, Steve? Steve Day? Yes. Very, very mm -hmm. good cause, absolutely. So uh, if, I don't, if, if you don't mind, Ben, maybe I'll jump in here and okay. do my okay. sales pitch once again. Um, if you're interested in, in, in getting the uh, concert tickets, you can do it one of two ways. You can let me know and we can do it. We can buy them from uh, Tori. I already told her we're at about 10 people now for the event. Uh, let me know. Or you can do what Ben did and just purchase them directly from the district website. Um, I, mailed, I, I emailed out to quite a few of you earlier today a reminder about raffle tickets. I focused on those who bought tickets last year who have yet to buy them this year. So um, please... Again, look at the uh, emails I've sent. Again, attach the link the web, uh, to the, web, the district website to buy both raffle tickets and also concert tickets. So my point, uh, my, my, my reach outs to you are gonna get more, more pointed if I don't hear back. 
when I say that, I mean, I'll be emailing each of you directly. And we'll talk about um, whether or not you'll be tickets this year. But I do thank everyone for their um, their purchases to date. And again, let's, as Ben said, let's make the 20th of November our club's uh, social activity as well as the district's uh, uh, Paul Harris celebration concert. Should be a lot of fun. Thank you. Well, one, one, one thing I was going to say, it looks like very... You can buy food and drinks there, but there might be an opportunity if some of us want to have dinner afterward that we're available, we could go out to dinner afterward. I think they Sounds great. Well, think the event's over at six o'clock. Am I right, Steve? Yes, it ends up six o'clock, correct, Ben. Okay. So we can talk about that. We still have time to decide what we want to do. Any and other announcements? All, Chris. Any other announcements? Okay, well, um, I'd like to remind everybody, I was at the UCLA game on Saturday uh, and I was holding my breath because UCLA was playing in Utah, the second uh, ranked team in two weeks. And uh, what I saw and witnessed was that they played their best game of the year and uh, they beat a very good team. SC is going to play Utah this Saturday, and we'll see if uh, how good SC and how good Utah purports to be, and we'll see uh, what's going to happen with the winner of that game. But nevertheless, USC and UCLA are undefeated at this point, and they're both within the top uh, 11 teams ranked in the country. I'm not used to this type of attention, and so therefore... It just doesn't seem possible that UCLA can be doing so well because their expertise is not football since I've been following them. So we'll see. It's uh, quite possible, and I don't know what the odds are, but it's it could happen on November 19th. They could face each other, both undefeated. And if that would happen, that would be some game to look forward to. All right. So I have some one-liners I would like to share with you. So please pay attention. Adam and Eve were the first ones to ignore Apple's terms and conditions. Two, if I got 50 cents for every failed math exam, I'd have $6.30 now. Three, What's the difference between ignorance and apathy? I don't know, and I don't care. Four, and finally, don't you hate it when someone answers their own questions? I do. <laughs> okay, I will now turn the meeting over to Peter, and he will introduce our speaker. Peter. Thank you, President Chris. Dr. John Mulcahy is director of the Carnegie Observatories in Pasadena, a world famous center for research on the evolution of the universe. He was a Carnegie postdoctoral fellow before joining the scientific staff in 1999 and was named director in 2015. Today, he leads the Pasadena campus as well as the Carnegie's large, large telescope sites in Northern Chile. In addition, Dr. Mulcahy is science deputy of the observatory's parent organization, the Carnegie Institute for Science, where he oversees the institution's five departments in the physical science and life science. Dr. Mulcahy's research focus on many key areas in astronomy, including dark matters and black holes. He is also a consultant to NASA and the National Science Foundation. In addition, he has created educational programs that reach audience throughout Southern California and beyond. These include the highly popular Carnegie Astronomy Lecture Series each spring and special programs for gifted high schools and undergraduate science students, among many others. Dr. Mulcahy has also made Carnegie Observatories the world's leading destination for top young postdoctoral fellow launching their careers in astronomy. 
In 2020, he received his RHSTAR Humanitarian Award for his service to scientific education. Please join me in welcoming back Dr. John Mulcahy. Hi, everybody. Thank you for having me again. Thank you for that introduction, Peter. Let me share my screen here. And we want to make this big. There, everybody can see that. Awesome, great. Well, I'm happy to be back. Uh, I wish it was in person, but it, it's it's probably a good thing we didn't because I ended up having to be in New York this week anyway. So I'm coming to you from my hotel room in rainy New York today. Uh, but I'm excited to tell you a little bit about the James Webb Space Telescope, which I know you all have heard a lot about. It has been uh, in the news quite a bit. Um, I think it's pretty fair to say that no telescope has had such a grand um, debut as the James Webb. And as I'll show you today, uh, it has really justified all the attention it's getting. And so I just start by pointing out that, you know, anytime astronomers build, uh, kind of have an increase in uh, a technology that is that we can build a bigger telescope or bring on some new characteristics to a telescope we always end up getting a new understanding of the universe and right here i've just listed kind of three times in human history where i think there have been kind of revolutions in astronomy revolutions in our understanding of the universe based on new technology and the first was going all the way back to galileo which uh you'll remember that galileo was um at the time of Galileo, uh, humans still believed that everything kind of uh, revolved around the Earth. Uh, and Galileo pointed his, his telescope up to the moons of Jupiter, Jupiter and saw the moons going around Jupiter and uh, realized right away that not everything was going around the Earth. And in fact, this was really the first direct evidence in support of Copernicus's theory that the sun was at the center of the solar system. That was, of course, a big revolution. And then if you go back about 99 years now to uh, Carnegie's own uh, Edwin Hubble, the very famous astronomer, using the brand new facilities at the time at Mount Wilson, these were the biggest telescopes in the world right uh, above, above uh, Pasadena. Um, Hubble had his two huge discoveries in the 1920s. The first was he basically discovered the universe as it was. He, um, he basically was the first to show that external galaxies uh, like the Milky Way exist that uh, it's not just one collection of stars, uh, but there's actually many such systems. Uh, and I'll show you many examples of those today. And then about five years later on, he went to show that the universe was expanding, another very huge revolutionary idea. All this was possible because he had the biggest telescopes in the world at Mount Wilson. And then the next revolution happened with our first space telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope, which for the first time really allowed us to kind of see very distant objects in the universe and thus kind of trace how the universe has changed in time because it takes time for light from distant objects to reach us, the light we're seeing left in the past. And so we're seeing what those objects look like in the past. And Hubble really allowed us to kind of trace back in time for the first time. And I'm gonna talk a lot about that in a few minutes. But first, let me just talk, remind you what the James Webb is. The James Webb is formally the follow-up to the Hubble Space Telescope. And it was designed uh, actually the, for the first time in 1993 was when we started talking about this. So it's almost 30 years ago. And it had two primary drivers, uh, really. The first is to check the first stars and galaxies in the universe. And I'll show some examples around that. And the second was just to study the planets around other stars. In the early 90s, we had, at that point, just two planets were known around other stars. This was a brand new field in astronomy, as I'll show you now. It's a very developed field in astronomy. But um, back then, the astronomers recognized that studying planets around other stars was going to be a very big field, and indeed it is. So why put a telescope in space? Let me just remind you, the reason is primarily to get above the atmosphere. Uh, and that's because the atmosphere has some effects we don't really like. The first is it just blurs light. Um, this is a nice little animation here, which shows you um, when light comes in through the atmosphere, turbulence will bounce that light around. This is why stars appear to twinkle in the sky. When you see a twinkling star, what you're seeing is actually a, the, a star is actually moving around. It's just not as grand as I'm doing with my hand here, but those movements are what effectively you see as the twinkle. And so this, this, this actually blurs the images as we observe them over time. And on the right there, you see an example of a, a, a pair of stars. And as the turbulence gets, as you go to the right, the turbulence is getting worse and worse. You can see the image quality gets worse and worse. So to get very sharp images, you want to, you try to be above the Earth's atmosphere. Here's just another beautiful example of this. This shows a ground-based image 
uh, on the left. And then you see the beautiful image with Hubble Space Telescope. And so being above the atmosphere, you, you can see things in much clearer detail. And this uh, allows you to interpret them much better. So that's the first reason we go to space. But the second reason, which is maybe not appreciated by everybody, is that uh, the universe emits all sorts of light um, across uh, many different uh, energies. Uh, the, the universe is emitting X-rays and ultraviolet and gamma rays, and infrared and radio emission, as well as the visible light. And the visible light is what we see with our eye. But it turns out that almost all of this uh, light is absorbed by the atmosphere. The only exception really is um, is the visible light and the radio light. And so if you want to, for instance, see what the X-ray, an X-ray from a, of like the sun looks like, you need to get above the atmosphere or very high in the atmosphere. So a space telescope opens up this entire range of energies of light, different types of light for us. And so that's uh, super exciting. And so how is James Webb different than Hubble? Here shows you two, the two primary differences. The first is it's just a much bigger telescope. Uh, James Webb uses segments, that is, it has 18 individual mirrors that kind of form together to form one mirror, where Hubble was a single mirror, or is a single mirror, but you see the size difference there is pretty tremendous. And a bigger telescope always allows you to collect more light and see fainter and fainter things. And I'll show you some spectacular examples from James Webb in a minute. Uh, but the other big difference here is the James Webb is, is designed to look at infrared light. It is not looking at visible light. Uh, that is light with your eye. So in fact, the images you see with James Webb, you would not see with your eye if you were in space and had an eye the size of James Webb. Hubble, you would. If you could go into space and your eye was the size of the Hubble Space Telescope, you would see things very similar to what Hubble sees because it's visible light. But James Webb works in the infrared. And I'll talk in a second now about why the infrared is interesting. The infrared is interesting for a couple of reasons. The first is simply that infrared radiation can penetrate dust much better than visible light. And this shows some examples here. On the left, you see this beautiful, this is a dusty star forming region. I'm gonna talk about these a little bit later. Uh, on the right, you see an infrared version. You see many more stars on the right than the left. The reason is because we're, with the infrared light, you can see through the cloud much better. And so you see all those stars that are in the background behind the dust. And so the infrared can penetrate dust just much better than visible light. So it allows us to see through dusty places and the universe is very dusty as I'll show some examples. The second reason is uh, because of what's known as the redshift. As, as the universe expands, objects, uh, galaxies are moving away from us at very rapid speeds. The further the way, the way they are from us, the faster they're moving away from us. That was basically what Edwin Hubble discovered in 1929. Um, and this has an effect on the light. It actually, uh, as an object is receding from us, the light gets stretched. It's called redshift. What it means is the, as the light gets stretched, it loses energy and moves to cooler and cooler energies. And so it moves from the visible light into the infrared. And so we believe the most distant objects in the universe are moving away from us so fast that their light is, they're no longer able to see them in visible light because all that light has been redshifted into the infrared. And so we need to go into the infrared to see the first stars and galaxies in the universe. And the third reason the infrared is interesting is just the infrared has an energy band where there's lots of interesting features. Um, although we, we see lots of pretty pictures in astronomy, and I'm going to show you many of them today, we spend a lot of our time not just taking pictures, but looking at light and dissecting it in what we call spectroscopy. And you're familiar with spectroscopy because if you take like a prism and you put light in, you know how the prism will kind of divide the light up into the colors of the rainbow. It's basically dividing the light up into different energies. We, spectroscopy just does that at a much more detailed level. And this little line you see here is actually a spectrum of the Earth's atmosphere. And all these huge dips and peaks are features in our atmosphere that tell us what's in the atmosphere. So in fact, you see their carbon dioxide, you see water, you see methane and oxygen. But if you, the interesting thing is that the water and the carbon dioxide is only visible in the infrared wavelengths. That's where those features are. So if you want to know if a distant planet has water in its atmosphere or carbon dioxide, you need to look in the infrared. So for these three reasons, infrared sees through dust, the universe, it helps us see light that has been redshifted out, and then these interesting features. The infrared is interesting, and that's why the James Webb was built to work in the infrared. Oh, but the problem with the infrared is the infrared is very difficult to do because things glow in the infrared. This is a great picture here. This is a picture of a human with a bag over their head, uh, and as you see on the right, that's you can't see the person really because the bag is blocking it, right? But on the left there, you see this glow, and that's because humans are warm, 
because we are warm, we actually are emitting radiation in the infrared. And so the problem with an infrared telescope is that if the telescope is warm, it's going to glow, and that glow is going to block out all the things you're trying to see in the infrared. So infrared telescopes need to be exceptionally cold to be able to study the universe. And that's a challenge which James Webb has to deal with. And so there's two couple of ways James Webb is doing that. The first is just James Webb is put in an orbit in, in real space. So the Hubble Space Telescope is in orbit around the Earth, very close to the up, upper atmosphere of the Earth. And in fact, the Earth itself is a source of infrared radiation because it's, it gets heated up by the sun, as is the moon. And so James Webb is actually out in space. Uh, you see its, its position there. It's about four times the distance from the Earth as the moon. And it's in a very unique place where the gravity of the Earth and the sun exactly interact so that, that James Webb orbits with the Earth at this distance. So it takes James Webb one year to orbit the sun, just like the Earth. Um, and in that process, it's, go, it's also doing this little circle there. You can see this kind of as it, it's kind of doing this little pattern and then going around the sun. Anyhow, so James Webb stays a distance from the Earth, close enough that we can communicate with it, but far enough away that the infrared radiation from the Earth doesn't get in the way. So that was one of the challenges. The second challenge, though, is the telescope itself is out in space. And the sun is, of course, sending solar radiation out in space. So the telescope does heat up. And so the way James Webb deals with this is by having one side that always faces the sun, and that side is getting really, really hot. And the other side is where the telescope is, is actually always facing away from the sun. But sunlight will still heat up the telescope. So the hot, the one side that's getting hit by the sun is very, very hot. So you have to get rid of that heat. And the way they do that is with this beautiful thing. You see this multi-layer sun shield there. And I'll show you, this is an example here. Or you can see it here on the right. This sun shield is designed to take the heat from the sun and eject it out the side of the telescope so that it never, the heat never actually gets to where the telescope itself is. And you'll see there on the left, the hot side is really hot. It's 185 Fahrenheit. The cold side is really, really cold. It's space basically, and it's minus 388. And so this allows the telescope because it's on the cold side to do all these beautiful observations without interference uh, from, from the heat. Okay, so what is James Webb doing? Well, the first thing James Webb is doing is probing the early universe. Uh, Edwin Hubble discovered the first galaxies back in 1923. With the Hubble Space Telescope, we've been able to go out in space and see further back. This is an image I, I'm sure I showed you at my previous talk because it's in almost every talk I give. This is the deepest image ever taken with Hubble. It's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And this was a, basically a 23-day exposure on a very tiny region of the sky. And basically every speck of light you see in this image is a galaxy. That is, it's a system of a billions of stars and trillions of planets. And there are about 3,000 in just this little image here. And the reason they're very tiny is because they're very far away. In this image, the average galaxy is about 10 billion light years away, which means that, that what you're seeing there is light that left 10 billion years ago. So this is kind of a picture of the universe 10 billion years ago. It's truly remarkable. Uh, and Hubble was able to go even further. If you dig into this image, you can see the most distant galaxy there is this little blippy thing you see on the right which is 13.4 billion light years away. So basically that was as far back as we've been able to go with Hubble. Now the universe itself, the Big Bang happened 13.8 billion years ago. So we're almost back to the Big Bang, but not quite. And we just can't get further with Hubble because of that redshift, that universe has redshifted and the more, the more distant objects are just shifted into the infrared and not visible anymore. Um, and so this is why you need James Webb. And so this was the very first image taken with James Webb. This is only 11 hours of integration compared to the 23 days I just showed you in that other image. It's not the same exact field, but it's the same dip. This is actually a deeper image. Um, and this image, uh, this was the one that Biden actually showed from the White House. That's, you know it's exciting when the president uh, releases the image from the White House. This is a hugely deep and beautiful image. And this, um, gal this is just a nice comparison with Hubble of the same field. And you can see, if you look on the left, the James Webb versus the Hubble, just how much deeper the James Webb is in a lot less exposure. This is 11 hours versus about 20 days again. And so you could just see James Webb because it's a big telescope, it can go much deeper. And in fact, here's just a nice little blink. So that's the, um, here's the Hubble image right here. And that's the James Webb image. And you just see a lot more galaxies pop out of the James Webb. It's just a much bigger telescope. And because of the infrared, it can see the more distant ones. 
In fact, I'll note you'll point out, I should point out, you see some things that are very, very red in this image that disappear in the Hubble. You don't see them at all. Um, and then they're not there. And then all of a sudden you see them. Those are those galaxies that are so distant that they've been redshifted entirely out of the Hubble band. You can't even see them with Hubble. So James Webb, just spectacular image. In just 11 hours, a small fraction of what Hubble could do. Um, and in fact, in this very first image, there's already a galaxy more distant than anything Hubble saw in the very first image. Um, and this one is seen about 300 million years after the Big Bang or about 13.5 billion years in the past. And I should say there are many candidates in this image already that are likely more distant. We just haven't confirmed them yet. So astronomers are very rapidly working on this data to try to confirm something even more distant. But already, how, already in just the first image, James Webb has seen the most distant thing we've ever seen. Um, and so just a couple of things, I already mentioned most of this before. The first thing is that there are many more galaxies that were seen with James Webb. If you take this, these deep images, this deep image from James Webb and extrapolate around the sky, we think there's close to maybe 10 trillion galaxies as opposed to the two trillion there was before. Many more galaxies than we assumed. The other interesting thing is you'll notice some of the red things that disappear um, and that show up only in the James Webb are kind of flat. These are like flattened galaxies. These are disk galaxies. You can think of them almost like an LP record you're seeing kind of edge on. And we thought these galaxies formed more recently in the universe, but James Webb has seen them very in very early in the universe, which means they were there before we thought they should be there. And so these are two things our models didn't predict and we have to work on our models to improve on. One, we have to say, why are there so many more galaxies? And two, why are so many of them disk galaxies? So both of these will, will really help improve our models for how the universe has changed in time. Um, the second area I want to talk about, it, you've seen some beautiful images from the birth and death of stars. Um, this is a detailed diagram. I'm not going to go into this a lot, except to say that all stars, we think, start in these giant gas clouds. I'm going to show you some spectacular examples. They then burn hydrogen in their lifetime. And in the upper path, that's the path of a star like the sun. Um, eventually, the sun will run out of hydrogen, and it will die in what we call a planetary nebula. The outer regions kind of get kicked off and just expand into space. In a very nonviolent way. The big stars blow up in these giant explosions we call supernovas. I'm not going to talk about those today. That's a whole other topic, but those are fun for different reasons. But um, some of the first James Webb images you, you've seen, in fact, are these star forming regions. And this is beautiful. This is my favorite of all the first images they released. This is the Carina Nebula. So I have to explain what you're seeing here because this is beautiful. Um, but imagine you have a gas cloud. A big, a big dense gas cloud. And what happens is gravity will try to condense this cloud down. And at the very center of the cloud, you'll have the first stars forming because that's the place where the gas is the densest and the gravity is the strongest. So stars kind of form in the middle of these clouds and then they emit radiation, the light you see, and some of them blow up in explosions if they're really massive stars. And they basically eat out a hole in the middle of the gas cloud. And that hole kind of expands outward as more stars are formed. So you can almost think of one of these star forming regions as kind of a gas cloud with a hole in the middle, like a donut. What you're seeing here, this bottom part is just the edge of that donut. You're just seeing the lower portion of that donut. This is just a piece. So there would be a much bigger, this would go over a much bigger scale into a circle. But you're seeing basically new stars forming. You're seeing the edge of that gas cloud as it's being eaten away by the new stars. Here's an example. This one is further away. So you can actually almost, you can see the hole, the donut hole in the middle here that hole there in the middle and the behind it, you see all those little white stars, like a cluster of white stars. Those are the new stars that are forming. Once again, these stars are gonna eventually eat up this cloud and, and, and it'll be done. Now, on the other end of the spectrum, I talked about stars dying. So the star like the sun will die. As I said, it'll run out of hydrogen in its core. And what will happen is the outer layers kind of get kicked off in these episodes. We don't understand it 100%, but um, this image here is an example of a star like the sun that has died. And what you're seeing here is you're actually seeing those outer layers that have expanded outward. So all the material, the nebula you're seeing there is actually the remnant of what was the star. And that stuff will eventually go out into space, leaving behind in the very center a really bright star. That is called a white dwarf. That's the core of the system. And that's a white dwarf star. Really, very. this is, as I said, the future of the sun in about 5 billion years. Um, and finally, the last topic I want to talk about are planets around other stars. We call these planets exoplanets. Um, and as of today, we know of almost 5,200 of them. This is a plot here. Uh, I don't like to usually show plots, but this is pretty simple. 
as you go up on the y-axis here, you go to bigger planets and you can see on the right there, there's the size of Earth, Neptune and Jupiter to give you scale. And so the things that are up there on the top at the blue are like Jupiter size. The things down at the bottom are more like Earth size. Um, and as you go to the right of this diagram, you're getting to stars being uh, planets being further and further from their star. Now you'll notice there's a little circle that says Earth-like worlds and it says none known. What that means is that's the location of where Earth would be on this diagram. It's an Earth it's an Earth sized planet, so it should be on the line where Earth is, as you see there. But we don't know any planets the size of Earth that are far enough away from their star, like the Earth is from the Sun. In other words, all the Earth Earth like planets we know size wise are very very are much closer to their star, so they're not necessarily great stars for looking for life around other uh, around these planets. So we don't really know of a planet just like Earth yet. We see things the size of Earth, but they're all much closer to their stars. And that's just because our techniques allow us to detect those in ways that it's harder to detect plants like Earth. Certainly other plants like Earth must exist. We just can't see them yet. But James Webb is gonna help in some ways look at some planets. This is the first image of a planet taken by James Webb. What you're seeing here is actually four different images and the glow, the, the purple, blue, uh, yellow, and, and red is the actual planet. The star has been blocked out in this case, because if the star wasn't blocked out, you wouldn't see the planet. And so the little white star diagram shows you where the star would be. But what you're seeing here is a planet that's actually a picture of a planet around another star. This is a very big planet. It's nine times the size of Jupiter, and it's very close to the star. And so it's very hot, which is why it's glowing and why we see it in the infrared. Um, and so this is not a planet where there would be life on it because it's hot and not it's very close to its star and it's made of gas, gas giant like Jupiter, but it's still pretty cool to see a planet, actually an image of a planet around a nearby star. Uh, James Webb also has the ability to do what I talked about earlier, that spectroscopy, that is take the light and look at it in detail. And this is the first spectrum that James Webb released of a planet's atmosphere, a different planet. And what these wiggles here correspond to water. And that means this planet has water in it. Once again, really interesting, because of course we think water is important for life. But this particular planet, like the previous one, is a big Jupiter-like planet. So probably not a great choice, even though Jupiter has water in its atmosphere too. Um, so having water is interesting, but this isn't, once again, that doesn't mean there's life there, or there's oceans there. It just means it's, it's a big planet with water, but it's still pretty interesting. And James Webb is going to allow us to see more of that. Um, and in addition, uh, for the first time with James Webb, we've seen carbon dioxide in a planet outside the solar system. And this is that feature. Once again, this is a giant planet though. So these are not planets like Earth. I just want to emphasize that. They're really interesting to understand big planets, but these are not planets we're going to find life on them. Now to find life on planets, we need to get to those small planets. And for that, we're going to need the next generation of telescope. And so if James Webb is the fourth revolution in astronomy after Galileo, Mount Wilson, Hubble, and now James Webb, the fifth generation will be these giant telescopes that are being built now around the world. There's three of them being built. The one on the left is the European telescope being built in Chile. The one in the middle is the one Carnegie is leading at our site in Chile called Giant Magellan Telescope. And the one on the right is the one that the University of California and Caltech is building. Hopefully in Hawaii, you may know there's some issues with the site there, but hopefully that telescope will be happening in Hawaii. But these three giant telescopes will be the next revolution because they're gonna allow us to see those very, very small planets that we really wanna get to eventually. Now, you may be asking, well, what about the atmosphere? These are on the ground, and I made a big deal about how James Webb being above the atmosphere is good. These telescopes have the ability to correct for the atmosphere. That is, they can take that, that, the twinkling and, and put it back, put the star all in the same place because they can measure the turbulence. The way they measure the turbulence is they make fake stars with these lasers. These lasers go up into the upper atmosphere and can make a fake star, and they can study how that fake star um, is changed by the turbulence and correct the real images. So this is really fancy technique, but this means they can get a good image quality despite the blurring. So they kind of correct for the blurring. Then this is why these telescopes are so powerful. They're just so much bigger than we can do in space. So here's an example that shows you the James Webb versus the giant Magellan telescope. It's smaller than one of our mirrors and we have seven giant mirrors. So this is a much bigger telescope. This means it can go much fainter than James Webb and we'll be able to see the smaller planets and the very, very early universe stuff. Um, and these also get better image quality because once again, we can correct for the atmosphere. And so this shows you on the left, James Webb, and this shows you the giant Magellan, even more detail than we can see with James Webb. So it's pretty impressive. 
And finally, I point out that these other telescopes on the ground also work in the optical. They don't work great in the infrared. They can work somewhat in the infrared. You can correct for the atmosphere a little bit, but they really work mostly in visible light. But what's interesting about visible light is visible light has some of the more interesting features we think to search for life, particularly oxygen and ozone. And actually in the case of the Earth's atmosphere, there's actually features in, in the visible light from the fact that we have rainforest. So there's actually reflection features off the rainforest directly telling you there was a forest there. So these big telescopes will probably be better at looking for search evidence of life because we think oxygen and ozone, which on Earth were created by plants, as well as some of these potential features from plants will be visible. So these next generation telescopes will probably be the ones to answer the question, is there life elsewhere in the universe? And so with that, I'm gonna end and just say with these first few images, James Webb has already revolutionized our understanding of the universe. And we now think it'll have a lifetime of at least 10 years, perhaps 20. And so it's just beginning to scratch the surface of what we'll be able to learn from this telescope. And so if you have me back in two years, I'll probably have many, many more things, mm -hmm. maybe even in one year about James Webb. It's really, truly incredible. So with that, I will stop my share and I'm happy to answer any questions if there are any. Okay, um, um, I would like to start with a question and then I'll get to you, Steve. Okay. Um, it seems to me that our technology is increasing at such a rapid uh, pace, you know, especially in the last 20 years. Yeah. And you know what we thought was not possible has now become possible. And what are you envisioning over the next so many years? Uh, I know a lot of us uh, like science fiction. A lot of us may be, uh, you know, Star Trek fans. Um, um, you know, a lot of science fiction is just science fiction until it isn't. Yeah. So I'd be very curious to hear what you have to say. Um, look what we've done in the last 20 years. What, what do you envision in the next 20 years? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's a really good point. I, it is worth pointing out that a lot of, I mean, just as you said, I mean, a lot of um, pretty much, you know, everything I've shown you here is just uh, like the James Webb would really not have been possible even 30 years ago. I mean, the technology, a lot of it was developed in the last 10 years. And I'll tell you the other big piece of this of course, is the advances in computing, which is really huge. That's that's the thing that has really allowed a lot of this to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, both, you know, in differences in, for instance, physical materials and development in that has helped, of course, for like the heat shields and stuff. But it's really the computation that's going to be the real leader. And you know, astronomers are starting to think about things like, you know, artificial intelligence to to analyze our data. People are starting to do some of those things. It's really hard to know, uh, but you know, there's no sign of it slowing down is I guess what I would say. I'd say that the advances are happening at a more rapid, rapid pace. And so I think it's really hard to know, you know, when are we gonna get to the point where we have some of the technology in Star Trek? You know, that's pretty advanced stuff, right? If you can teleport. Um, and I don't think we're close to anything like that, but certainly, um, Certainly, you know, I, I expect that, that, you know, 20 years from now, we'll be looking back going, oh my gosh, James Webb was pretty primitive. Because um, Hubble looks pretty primitive. Hubble was launched 30 years ago now, and it's a pretty amazing instrument, but it looks kind of primitive compared to James Webb over 30 years. So that likely will happen again. Do you ever um, wonder when we're looking out for planets uh, throughout the galaxy, if someone else is looking at us? Well, yeah. The, so there are people, of course, who who look at that question. There are people who are studying other systems, looking for radio signals and such from them. I think the challenge there is that the universe is exceptionally big and there's a lot of planets. Our own Milky Way probably has a trillion planets in it. And so the question is, you know, why would they, be, you know, the odds of them looking at Earth at any particular moment is uh, is probably pretty slim. Now that said, once again, if their technology is much more advanced and they can monitor, we don't have a way of monitoring a trillion planets at once. Maybe they do, and maybe they would, you know, uh, but we certainly have not, you know, there are people who look for this and there's certainly nothing, nothing has happened yet that is convincing that we've, you know, the, that, that somebody knows about us, I guess I would say. Okay, Steve, go ahead. Yeah, um, great talk. Um, you were mentioning that as uh, we investigate life on other planets and look at some markers that are biological in nature, isn't it also possible 
um, we're a messy planet. We have a lot of yep. pollution. Isn't it possible that that's what we'll be searching for as well? Not just biological, but industrial byproducts, that kind of thing. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, it, is it certainly entirely possible, right? That that um, you you could find a planet. In our case, um, those things are still a pretty small fraction, even though they're, they're terrible for us <laughs> and terrible for our planet. They're they're not a huge. Um, it's not a huge uh, percentage of our atmosphere composition. Our atmosphere composition is still mostly oxygen and nitrogen. Um, now, yeah, and carbon dioxide we know occurs somewhat naturally. So the problem with carbon dioxide is interesting, but like Venus is 98% or something carbon dioxide. And so, which is one of the things we're of course putting a lot of into our atmosphere. Uh, but there are other things that, that could be interesting biosignatures, things that were less, um, uh, that may, you can't make in some natural way maybe. And so it's certainly entirely possible that those things exist. Mm -hmm. um, most people are thinking, you know, the problem is we think about what we know, which is the Earth's atmosphere. And so, you know, that's why the concentration is on oxygen, because that's such a strong signature on Earth. And it's a strong signature on Earth because we believe all that oxygen came from plant life. I mean, oxygen shouldn't exist in our atmosphere otherwise. And it's the second most common element. So I think that's why we've concentrated on that. But there certainly could be other other things that one would look for. Thank you. Uh, Gordon. You're muted. Yep. Uh, I guess it's a similar question, but are there any things that, from a practical standpoint, we think that we might be able to gain from from this, other than the pure science of exploration and and understanding the universe? Yeah, I mean, I, I would say that um, you know, I always make the case that that just the understanding justifies it. It's not a, it's expensive, but it's not expensive compared to many other things we do. Uh, and of course, it's hugely inspirational. I was talking to some people yesterday. I gave this a similar talk here in New York yesterday. And, and you know, people were so fascinated by it. And I just said, you know, it's such a great positive thing to happen in 2022 when it's been a year with a lot of terrible things. <laughs> uh, you know, it's, a, it's an accomplishment of humans that we've launched this thing, the technical thing. Now, that said, there are a lot of applications that do come out of the development of the technology. Um, and so, in fact, you may not. The first Wi-Fi came out of astronomy. Uh, the white, the technology for Wi-Fi was something we built for radio telescopes. Your infrared remote that you use uh, for your TV came out of the NASA space program. So there are many such applications, and there are many military applications, almost certainly that about related to James Webb technology. We just don't know about them. So there are certainly some spin-offs, you know, and that's one way that, you, of course, always uh, NASA, for instance, makes the case to Congress. To fund these things is there are a lot of uh, 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 there are a lot of practical applications from it. But from my own astronomical point of view, I don't, you know, I don't, I don't feel we need that as justification. I feel it's worth spending some money on such a thing. It's it's just a human accomplishment. I I, I wasn't even questioning that at all. I yeah, think you're just wondering is, now. That's I just wonder if there's anything that we expect to find or think ah. that we might find, you know. Yeah, I don't know. That's a really good question. I think that, well, I should say the other thing is the things I've shown you today from James Webb, are, these are really the first batch of images that came out like just a couple of months ago. We're still spending a lot of time on them. The, the, there are going to be things that James Webb finds that we know nothing about. And that's mm -hmm. the most exciting thing. The exciting thing with any new telescope are the things you're not expecting and not predicting. And so almost certainly, actually, a year from now, I'd be shocked if I didn't have three examples of something we did not expect. I mean, there already were a few from just these first images, but those experiments, so I should point this out. The, these images you've seen were, all, were taken at the very beginning of the mission and released to the whole public. The rest of the mission is actually not, it, individual astronomers get time on the telescope. And the way you get time is you write a proposal. And if your proposal is successful, and only about 10% of proposals are successful, then you get time on the telescope to do your own program. And so those programs are ongoing right now. And there's going to be all sorts of things from there that were not that will come out that no one was expecting, I think. Okay. Uh, Tom. Yeah, I have two offbeat questions. I'm just blown away by your presentation. You're so good. You're, of all the speakers we've had, uh, Doctor, that you're the best. Yeah, <laughs> I appreciate that. Good. <laughs> Seriously, uh, 
how old were you when you wanted to follow this career path in astronomy? I mean, uh, that, that that's a great question. I always say that I was a born an astronomer. I, I started very, very young, personally. I was certainly into astronomy by the time I was five, according to my mom. And my mom um, recognized that I was interested in astronomy early on um, and bought me a lot of books because, of course, the Internet didn't exist. And so my mom was really good about getting me books and getting me, you know, so I did a lot of reading very young. I got my first telescope when I was seven and I built a telescope. I made the mirror and everything when I was 12. So I was pretty hardcore. And then um, and then I went to Berkeley and from there ended up being an astronomer. I would say that there are many astronomers that share my story uh, where they, you know, they started very young. Then there's a whole different batch of people who were just super smart and went to college and just discovered astronomy from taking in some class at college. They were good in math and physics and then went on to be astronomers. So there are both types, but I'll tell you, we, we go to schools and we bring telescopes and we do, uh, we do star parties quite frequently in the area. And there's always, every time, there's always one kid who's super excited about looking through a telescope. And you know, those are the ones that you know may be on a path to be either an astronomer or a supportive role. They could be working at NASA on the Mars missions or something, you know. And quickly, is it possible to purchase a picture of that Korean nebula or similar like things for your? So the Korean, those images are all available online, and they're such high resolution, you can download them for free. Just do a search on Korean nebula; that'll take you to the site where James Webb is, and they're high enough you could actually print them, and they would pretty large, and they would be gorgeous. In fact, I'm probably going to do that for our building. Yes, the Korean that is, but they are such high quality you can you can get them for free off the internet. Thank you. Mark. Uh, doctor, I'm fascinated with it, with, with this. Um, I've written two science fiction fantasy books, and so I love this stuff. But I have to ask you, when you're talking about uh, the basic uh, materials that we have to have to have the carbon-based life forms of some sort, doesn't gravity play a major role in all of that? Well, gravity plays a major role in everything. So yes, the answer is yes. Um, and so, well, several things pointing out, you know, it, uh, you know, I pointed out that we don't really know of a planet just like Earth yet. We see Earth-like planets, but we don't know of some just like the Earth. And, and in fact, I often make the case that plants like the Earth may end up being a little rarer than we think. Um, there may be plants that are the right size of the Earth and made of the right chemicals as the Earth, but the Earth is special for a lot of reasons. It's special because it's around a star. It's the right distance from a star where water can exist on our surface very easily. It's the right distance from a star that's very, very stable. The sun is stable for like 10 billion years. Other stars, sometimes stars die within millions of years. And some stars have all sorts of like flaring activity and they change in their brightness by a factor of a thousand over a week. Imagine if the sun got a thousand times brighter, we would have real problems, right? So there's a lot of things. The earth has a magnetic field, which protects us from solar radiation. It has a moon, which allows tides to occur in the oceans, which is part of all, all of these things are relevant to life on Earth. And so I guess what I would say is, so that's all those, the, there's so many factors, but gravity is the dominant factor that, of course, determines what ends up in the Earth, because it pulls that material in. When I showed these beautiful um, nebulas, I showed the Carina Nebula and I showed the Tarantula Nebula, <clears throat> what's happening in those systems is new star systems are forming but it is gravity. Gravity, all that is, is gravity. It's gravity pulling that material together, and you know what it happens to fall together is what ends up in that star and in the planets around that star. So you know, gravity is the dominant uh, force on those scales. Okay, Steve. Thank you. Great talk. And uh, I remember when you spoke last, right. and I was wondering <laughs> if your opinion has changed. Ah, what did I say? And and the question was, what is your opinion of what existed a moment before the Big Bang? Uh, and your your answer last time was, you're not going to be satisfied with my answer. And you yeah. said, and you said, I have absolutely no idea. Yeah, uh, no, my answer hasn't unfortunately changed. It hasn't been that long. If it had changed, you probably. <clears throat> You would have seen me on the front page of the New York Times or something. I, you know, <laughs> if we had the answer to that question, it it is a um, you know that's a difficult one. We don't really, of course, know what happened before the Big Bang, and you know there are people who think that the Big Bang has happened multiple times that it's a recurring thing. There's all these sorts of theories, 
you know, most of our evidence suggests that that isn't the case, that this is the one and only Big Bang. That was the one and only Big Bang for us. But I always say that we don't, our understanding of, of the large scale universe and how it works is so poor. Um, I shouldn't say that, but that's how it, the, the reality is that it has changed so much in my 30 years as a professional astronomy, the understanding. Um, and just you see the James O images changes everything with just one image that I would I think we don't know enough to really know whether there were multiple Big Bangs or what happened. I just think we don't know. Yeah, same answer. Gosh. Yeah, same. It'll be the same answer in a year if you bring me back. <laughs> All right, Ed, go ahead. I, I <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I had a question uh, always intrigued me about the speed of light. For example, when you look at the Big Bang and the explosion and so forth, I guess things happen so quickly and it's such a small time frame. probably things were blasted out greater than the speed of light, which is, I guess, 186,000 miles a second. The second question having to do with the speed of light <clears throat> and having at the outer <clears throat> end of the universe, which is 3.8 billion years old, you're saying that uh, things are expanding, the Earth, uh, the universe is expanding and it's expanding with an increasing speed. Is the speed now exceeding the, uh, the speed of light and e, e equal mc squared and all of that? It's all kind of strange. Yes, it does. And, but you've answered your own question. The answer is that it is true that nothing, that anything with mass cannot go faster than the speed of light, but the universe does, isn't mass itself. What is being created is space itself. And so, in fact, the expansion is much greater than the speed of light. Uh, absolutely. And so, but that doesn't fall under the E equals MC square law. <laughs> uh, the exception is space itself. Uh, but Einstein was right. And the E equals MC squared is basically saying that mass is equivalent to energy. And what it says is that if your mass, your mass basically needs to go to zero for you to travel at the speed of light or close to zero. And so uh, if you have a mass, then, then, then those laws apply. But the universe is the exception is space itself. One other qu question is: uh, <clears throat> Are there other universes? And if the, yeah, uh, where Maybe. are they? If we're we're expanding forever and ever, where where the hell are they? It's so that's a very interesting theory that's quite popular now, particularly in science fiction. There's a thing called the multiverse, which is the idea that there are many big bangs that went off, and that each of these universes basically you, 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 they don't communicate with each other. So you know, what we see is our universe could be one universe and there could be many, many others. Um, and so there are lots of theories about that. There's really no observational evidence, which is the challenge with it. You know, there are people who've tried to come up with ways of, uh, you know, how could you ever prove that there was that more universes? It's not clear to me that's something we're going to know in our lifetime. There's going to have to be a major, um, some major new understanding in physics or something you know, you, which may happen, right? I mean, maybe you get another guy, Einstein or something today that, that takes us in a whole new direction. But at the moment, that's not, uh, we have no way of testing that, but it's entirely possible. I have no way of saying this, that there aren't other universes. All right, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Just uh, before we wrap up, do you uh, work with any other international scientists? Oh, is absolutely. It something just the United States is working on or do, how do you collaborate and Sure, that's a great question. I, sh I should point out that the James Webb is actually a collaboration between all of Europe and the US. So even though it has been driven more so by NASA and it was built in the US and such, there are major components that were built in Europe and by European teams. So we, and we all work quite extensively, particularly with Europe uh, and here, but also astronomers in South America, Australia, uh, Japan has a very good group. Um, and even now China is, is coming up in astronomy, although because the political, tensions, that's more challenging. Both China and, of course, Russia are kind of off limits because of uh, because of the political situation. But there are astronomers working in those places that we would normally be working with. Um, and I should say the Giant Magellan Telescope, the, the ground-based one that we're building in, at Carnegie, is, um, is a collaboration that involves Brazil and North Korea and Australia as partners. So we definitely have partners. OK, Steve Day, last question. You're muted. Yeah, you're muted. You're mute, Steve. There you go. Love that mute button. Uh, actually, uh, Ed pretty much asked the question. I was going to ask about the multiverse because you said, Doctor, you said for us when you said there's probably been only one Big Bang for us. I was going to ask you then who is they, but I think you answered Ed's question. Yeah, I think the question is it's like yes, maybe um, 
Yes. As far as we know, there's one universe and that's ours. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's as far as we know. And we, we certainly cannot rule out uh, other universes. I'm just wondering if there's another Steve Day out there. <laughs> there might be many Steve Days out there for all we know. Steve I'm sure. God, for, God forbid, Steve. <laughs> well, as long as there's only... Never mind. <laughs> thank yeah. you. All right. um, anyway, uh, thank you so much for your fabulous presentation today. It's very informative. Um, it's a subject that we all like to hear about. And I can... Um, like to reserve you on Steve Day's behalf when he becomes president next year ah. for a return visit. We'd very much love to hear from you. And uh, at that time, I'm sure you're going to have many more um, interesting photos to share with us and comment on. So thank you again. Absolutely. Incredible uh, presentation. And um, I know if we had a little more time, we'd have even more thoughtful questions for you. I, I appreciate it always, and I'm happy to come back in the future. So thank you very much. And maybe next time I'll see you all in person. That would be wonderful, too. That'd be great. We'd love yeah. that. Awesome. Um, all right. Thank before, you, I, before, thank you. I, before I say goodbye, uh, just a reminder, we have our uh, next meeting at Guido's, and our district governor will be there. I'm hopeful that we see all of you. And until then, have a very good week and root for UCLA. Thank you, Erica, for arranging this. Thank you for having us there. It's a real pleasure. And I hope you'll come for a, a private tour of our campus in Pasadena as well. I'd like to arrange that with you if you're interested. Wonderful. Uh, hey, we would be very ahead. interested and uh, uh, we will follow up with you, Peter, especially. Please. Thank you. Okay. okay. I'll work Thank with you. you. So Great. You. Take Any care. other final comments? Okay, we are done. Thank you all. Bye-bye.